Welcome to Cincy Reformed Podcast. I'm Pastor Brandon. I'm joined with Pastor uh, Zach, and we're pastors at Westside Reformed Church, a congregation of the URCNA in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, if you're in the Cincinnati area, we would love to have you uh, check us out at 10 o'clock uh, a.m. on Sunday. But today, we would like to talk about covenant theology. Now, obviously, that is a massive topic. There are a lot of books written about covenant theology, but we would like to give the listener just a thumbnail kind of overview sketch about uh, what covenant theology is and, and how it's applied and how it's practical uh, in terms of the Christian life and, and the life of the church. But uh, before we kind of dive into any of those specific uh, Zach, I was wondering, could you maybe tell us a little bit about at its most basic level, what is covenant theology? As you said, Brandon, it's hard to overstate the importance of covenant theology. As I'm thinking about some of the episodes we've done in the past, they are all intersecting with covenant theology in some form. We talked about the sacraments. We talked about the resurrection of Christ. Mm-hmm. All these things, we've talked about uh, infant baptism. Liturgy. Everything, exactly, is, is connected and rooted in covenant mm-hmm. theology in some way, shape, or form. And so I've heard some people talk about covenant theology as an architectonic structure, which basically yes. refers to the, uh, the, the beams, the uh, structure of a house or a building that you cannot see necessarily, but that holds it up. It holds it upright. It gives it the structure. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about the Bible and the Christian life, we're thinking about the covenant theology being those support beams that are underneath it. It's the foundation of the house. It's the the studs inside the walls of the house and those kinds of things that that allows you to live inside that house. That's covenant theology. But if you're thinking maybe a little more precisely, though, if we think about covenant theology, we're thinking about a relationship that God initiates and and how he interacts with with humans. He made us to be covenant creatures. And so from the very beginning of creation, he is related to his creatures by way of covenant. And so we all stand in some relationship to God. There's an idea out there that, that becoming a Christian, you're beginning a relationship with God. But no, you've always had a relationship with God. The question is, are you relating to him as a covenant breaker or a covenant keeper in Christ. And so just speaking about being a human is to begin talking about covenant theology. Hmm. So God enters into covenants with his people from the very beginning. He relates to his people by way of covenants. When we think about the Bible, we got a Bible here. We're thinking about two testaments. Testament could just as easily be translated covenant. A covenants fill the Bible. Sometimes they're assumed. But it's how God relates to us and how he um, joins himself to us and us to him and so forth. So uh, anything else you might say in terms of a big, big picture sketch of covenant theology? If not, I mean, we can start talking about the some uh, three main covenants. That's... Yeah, no, I don't have anything else to add. I mean, it's just the shape of how God put the Bible together and how God has continually dealt with his people. Um, it's not something that is somehow imposed on the text of, of, of the Bible. It's not something that man created and then is trying to cram into Scripture, but it's something that Scripture is just giving us in terms of yeah. it is a covenantal stru- structure from, from beginning to end, covenantal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, let's, let, let's jump into the uh, three main covenants, if you want to call them that, that uh, um, uh, according to which the Reformed tradition and Presbyterian tradition has utilized to help us think covenantally about the biblical text. And so, uh, Brian, why don't you kick us off with the uh, covenants of redemption, sometimes called the pactum salutis, to use the fancy Latin language, but uh, why don't you give us that? The covenant of redemption is talking about the agreement, you could say, uh, between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's an inter-Trinitarian um, covenant that was made in eternity past, prior to creation. And in this covenant, they, uh, the, the members of the Trinity, and of course, you know, our Trinitarian theology has to uh, 
impact how we're how we're understanding this the, the trinity uh, uh, there is one god and three persons in the godhead and the one god has one will one intellect one power i mean so we have to understand this was not something where uh the son was like oh i don't know if i want to do that and the father was like no you have to do it it, it wasn't like that at all um again we we don't want to abandon our trinitarian uh, doctrine and understanding here uh, but it was an agreement wherein the Trinity decided that they would create and redeem a people uh, in Christ. And that again happened prior to, um, to Christ actually coming in the flesh. And when Christ does come into the flesh, we see an outworking of this Trinitarian covenant. Uh, many times in the Gospels, Jesus will talk about... Uh, I'm, I'm doing the work that the Father gave me to do. So there was some sort of work that the Father gave Jesus to do, and that was prior to him coming. This was something already kind of planned out in the covenant of redemption. We see that language in Luke chapter 2, John chapter 5, Jesus very much fulfilling all that the Father gave him to f- fulfill. Uh, even when it comes to the res- or the uh, the death of, of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ, that was something that was already agreed upon and planned. In fact, uh, Acts chapter 4 uses a very strong word. It says that the crucifixion of Christ and all of the necessary players, um, Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Jews, the Roman Gentiles, um, everybody, all the pieces that that had to be there for the the crucifixion to happen, it says was predestined. Luke uses that very strong word there in Acts 4, all that was predestined to, to happen. Again, showing us that there was a plan in back of all of this. Uh, we see a couple places in the Bible where we see this, this, um, inter-Trinitarian covenant and being revealed in Scripture. Uh, I'll read a few of those texts to you. Isaiah chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or l- lift up his voice or make it heard in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a dimly burnt burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not fail or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it, I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness, I have taken you by the hand and kept you, I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeons, from the dark prisons, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to graven images. And so you'll notice that Part of this text is what um, Jesus speaks about in terms of his own mission to give eyes to the blind and bring out prisoners and so on and so forth. And notice how God says, I have given you as a covenant to my people. And again, there's um, many passages in the Bible that speak. I just gave you a few of them that will kind of hint at or show us and speak to this inter-Trinitarian covenant of redemption that that took place and is actually kind of in the background behind what is coming in redemptive history. It's really helpful, Brandon. I I think as well about having just preached through John's gospel, Mm -hmm. just the the many times that Jesus talked about why he came, why he was sent. And so it gets at what you're talking about. There's something behind uh, there's a there's a great purpose behind that mission of the Father sending the Son. It's so helpful. Mm-hmm. When we think about the uh, these overarching covenants, we uh, began with the covenant of redemption. A uh, second one that's oftentimes discussed is what's called the covenant of works. Some have called it the covenant of nature, uh, the commandments of life. You find this language in the Belgic Confession. Different words can be used to describe the covenant of works, but 
probably the most common language is covenant of work, so yeah. we'll use that right now. Mm-hmm. As the language of covenant of work suggests, that this is a, a legal relationship that God established, and we're thinking about here the Garden of Eden between God and Adam, especially. Adam being the federal head of all of mankind. And when we think about that text in Genesis, you might not see the word covenant there, but it has all the marks. It's got that, that old saying, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's, it's a duck. And that's what we see in the book of Genesis. You have the Lord putting his servants and bringing him into the Holy Land and into his garden. You see God performing good work and that man is supposed to follow in God's footsteps, as it were, to perform good work like God had done, working well from morning until evening, six days, and then resting on the seventh. We see in that text that there is a threatened curse if Adam did not fulfill his calling, and that transgression of the covenant of works was really epitomized within that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There was, of course, a tree there of the knowledge of good and evil, but that represented something. It represented Adam and woman uh, deciding to put themselves in the place of God, to themselves decide that we would reign over um, creation rather than allowing God to reign and us being his, uh, his faithful covenant servants. And then the threat and sanction to um, uh, exalt ourselves uh, was death. Uh, the curse sanctioned there. We also see within the Garden of Eden that there was a tree of life, which uh, clearly shows us that Adam and Eve, while they were alive, (laughs) that something more was being offered to them. Not mere probation for endless probation to have this ongoing threat of possible sin and possible death. But there's a tree of life there that pledged to them that if they would follow the Lord's commands if they would love God with all heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love one another, their neighbor, as themselves, then they would one day go beyond probation and enter into a stage of eternal life that was being signified and sealed by that tree of life. They would have inherited glory, and all of us in Adam, the first Adam, would have inherited glory with them. But sadly, that's not how things went, obviously. And in the day they ate it, they surely died. Not merely biological death, but spiritual death. One sin did that. This was not a covenant of grace, because one single sin cast us all into um, spiritual darkness and into spiritual death. Language might not be used there in um, Genesis 2 to to say this is a covenant, but clearly uh, has all the markings of a covenant. As uh, Hosea 6 reflects, and as, I think it's Isaiah 28, if I'm not mistaken, uh, reflects, maybe 24, that there there was a covenantal arrangement uh, back in the garden. Uh, Hosea speaks about the nation of Israel and talks about how they, by their infidelity toward the Lord, are being cast into exile, into death. And it's described that they were like Adam. Mm-hmm. They transgressed the covenant is the way that Hosea speaks about Israel. Like Adam, they transgressed. And um, we, so we can think about how the Old Testament reflects upon the Garden of Eden. We could also think about just the uh, simple reality of Jesus as second Adam. That the first Adam had a calling that went unfulfilled. And then we have Christ come as second Adam to fulfill those things that Adam failed to fulfill, and also to atone for the sin that Adam and his posterity have brought into this fallen world. So Christ, as second Adam, he did not come in a relationship of saving grace toward his father, but he came to fulfill all righteousness. He came to fulfill the law's demands. He came to bear the curse of the law. He entered into the covenant of works, that Adam failed to fulfill, and our second Adam fulfilled it. We could also think maybe even a little further about this entire scenario that when you think about a, an epistle, a letter like uh, Paul's letter, first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, there's a really amazing thing that Paul does there in around verses 40 through 50. 
where he speaks about the natural and the spiritual. And he says, if there is a natural, then there must be a spiritual. And what Paul's doing there is he's not saying, he's not contrasting what's material and immaterial. He's contrasting two stages of materiality, you could say. That if there's a natural creation, then there certainly is a capital S spiritual creation. There's a transition from this age to the age to come. There is not merely the natural body, but there's a resurrection body, which is material. And that contrast is really provocative, I think. I don't know if you want to say anything else about that contrast there before you tell us about the covenant of grace, Brandon, but no, I, I mean, find that to be really persuasive. Yeah, and when I, when, I, when I speak about that, I'll usually talk about it, how it's natural physical versus spiritual physical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times we hear the word spiritual and, I, and we think disembodied spirit right. floating around. But no, Jesus' bo resurrected body was very much material. He said, put your hands mm -hmm. in, in here, put your hands in my side. Give um, me some fish to eat. Yeah, give me fish to eat. <laughs> so it was very much um, physical. So don't think that Paul is somehow saying it's less than physical. Uh, but no, it is it is it is physical. And what I like about what Paul does there in that section is he contrasts a dead body being sown into the ground in weakness, raised though in power, sown in dishonor, raised in honor, and he kind of compares and contrasts this natural body that dies with the spiritual body that is raised. And then, right after he makes that comparison, he makes a comparison between Adam's body and Jesus' resurrected body. But what's amazing is that he uses the exact same language as the dead body sewn into the ground to Adam's pre-fall body. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. Adam's pre-fall right. body was not under the strain of death, because death had not intruded on creation. There was no sin prior to Adam's sin. Uh, in terms of um, what was going to affect mankind and creation. and But it's interesting how Paul almost is arguing that when you compare pre-fall body of Adam in garden to Jesus' resurrected body, Adam's pre-fall body is functionally death-like in comparison compared to the resurrected body of Christ, kind of showing what that body would have been, the advancement that would have taken place had Adam fulfilled all righteousness in the garden as he was as he was mandated. Yeah, exactly. We offer that as a just a note in terms of how this covenant theology you might not again use the word covenant in that text. Mm -hmm. But to explain what's happening there, you have to use covenantal concepts and covenantal yeah. language mm -hmm. to think about probation and going beyond probation. So Coming into works, where we're getting at main, main text there: Genesis one and two, Hebrews six ver, or Hosea six verse seven, and as we talked about, um, thinking about First uh, Corinthians fifteen yeah. and elsewhere. But sure. Brandon, how about you tell us about the uh, third of this big overarching? Covenantal categories, uh, covenants of grace. Yeah, so you have the covenant of redemption, that's the inter-Trinitarian um, covenant. Then you have the covenant of works with Adam, pre-fall, Garden of Eden. And then um, something amazing happens as God comes in the garden in the spirit of judgment to judge Adam and Eve um, as covenant breakers before him. He, he enters into... Uh, a new way, I guess you could say, that, that he previously was not under the covenant of works, and we call this the covenant of grace, beginning in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, um, God gives a, a promise, kind of the first promise of the gospel, where he says, one day, the seed of the woman, he's talking about Jesus, the seed of the woman will come, and he will crush the seed uh, of the serpent, the head of the serpent. And uh, just a great promise. And the covenant of grace spans from Genesis 3.15 all the way into the new covenant. 
and um, the uh, Abrahamic covenant, the um, Mosaic economy, uh, the uh, covenant with David. I mean, all of these are administrations, various administrations of the covenant of grace. I had a couple definitions of the covenant of grace that I thought would be helpful because um, so these authors, they summarize the covenant of grace well, and I think it might help clarify to our listener what the covenant of grace is. So the covenant of grace, as defined by Michael Brown and Zach Keel, they say is the covenant between God and believers with their children in which he promises salvation through faith in Christ who merited their salvation by his obedience in the covenant of redemption. Michael Horton uh, he, he defines the covenant of grace in this way. He says, It is a post-fall covenant between the triune God and Christ with the church, with Christ as its head and mediator. It began with God's promise of salvation to Adam and Eve and continues through the family of faith leading from Seth to Noah and on to Abraham and Sarah all the way to the new covenant as inaugurated by Christ's death. In this covenant, God promises to be our God and to make believers and their children his own redeemed family with Christ, the last Adam, as its federal representative, head, and mediator. It is the historical unfolding of the eternal plan of God in the covenant of re redemption. Notice how both of those definitions bring back into view the covenant of redemption and speaking about the covenant of grace as uh, kind of unfolding what had what was kind of in back of it. And then finally, there's one more um, definition I'll read you, and that's Gearhardus Voss. He says, The covenant of grace is the gracious bond between the offended God and the offending sinner in which God promises salvation by the way of faith in Christ and the sinner receives this salvation by believing. So in other words, it's not like in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, it was do this and live. It was perfect, personal, exact, entire obedience in thought, word, and deed from cradle to grave uh, was in view for Adam. We can't do that. Now, now that we are fallen in Adam, sinners before the face of God, we cannot render perfect obedience, uh, perfect personal exact entire obedience in thought, word, and deed from cradle to grave. We all fail. N none of us are, uh, um, can live up to the perfection of the covenant of works. And so the covenant of grace is something that Christ does for us on our behalf. Christ fulfilled the covenant of works so that we might experience the covenant of grace, um, being uh, having the imputed righteousness of Christ that uh, becomes the, the foundation upon which we are forgiven, justified, uh, and we receive that by faith. It's not of works. It is a gift of God, lest anyone should boast. So, um, Zach, now that we've kind of talked about those three big heads of covenants. Mm -hmm. um, one of the key beliefs in the Reformed uh, world is how the different covenants unfold, how covenants are fulfilled. So, for example, one of the big tenets in the Reformed world is how the Abrahamic covenant is fulfilled in the new. Mm -hmm. um, could you maybe talk about that more? How does the covenant sure. with Abraham impact the covenant with Jesus? Or in, in Christ. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a great question. I think that's significant to, to, to go from from talking about Abraham, because if we think about Paul and how he speaks about the church, we are the children of Abraham, and we are part of his promises and the, the blessings promised to him. And so we really are called by Paul, the seed of Abraham, and the part of the family of Abraham. So it's a good question. I think that um, it's also good up front to note that the Abrahamic covenant is not the same thing as the old covenants right. or the Mosaic uh, covenants or however you want to define that Sinaitic, Sinai covenant. These are two different covenants they're two distinct ones as Paul makes very clear in Galatians uh, chapters 3 and 4. So when we're thinking about the Abrahamic covenant, yes, it's inside the Old Testament. Right. It's in the Old Testament narrative but it's not the same thing as 
the old covenants. So we need to keep that, I think, clear in our minds. When, with the Abrahamic covenant, we find a, an unconditional promise that God makes to Abraham. He, in chapter 15, he puts him into a, a, a he puts him on the ground. Uh, probably the only person I can think of who's been slain in the spirit in reality. <laughs> He's slain in the spirit. He sees a vision. God walks through animal parts. God makes a promise to Abraham. Abraham is not allowed to walk through the animal parts. God does because God is making a unilateral promise to Abraham that he would give Abraham a, a nation, a people. He would give um, Abraham a place, a holy land, and that his people would enjoy God's blessing there. And it would come through the seed of Abraham. So people, place, blessing, all of that through the Abrahamic seed, through the offspring. And so what we find then happening within the new covenant is the same unconditional, unilateral act of God bringing those things to its fulfillment. That it was not ultimately about a nation state of Israel in an earthly holy land called Canaan. It wasn't ultimately about long life and milk and honey and earthly prosperity inside Canaan that came through the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It wasn't ultimately about that. It's about something much bigger, much grander than the types and shadows of the Old Testament that ultimately we find that the seed of Abraham is Jesus Christ. He is that great offspring. And in him then we find God's people, the church, lowercase c, Catholic, from the fall until Christ returns. We find the place is the new creation, and the blessing is the Holy Spirit and eternal life poured out upon us. And so that is where we find the Abrahamic covenant brought to fulfillment. It's not like a completely different kind of covenant. It's the same covenant. We're just on the fulfillment side of things. And so we rejoice to find the seed of Abraham was not just Isaac or Jacob, but as Paul himself says, is Jesus. So we're pretty secure in the new covenants. Mm -hmm. And we're still one in the same covenant as the Abrahamic, just on this side of the cross. Anything you might add to that, Brandon? No, I think that's I think that's helpful. Um, and I think it shows, I mean, I think our, our, our listeners can probably already tell that the covenant theology just permeates um, so many things. I wanted to say everything, but uh, I don't want to. I don't pretty want to, close. It's pretty close to everything. I mean, covenant theology is so practical. Very practical. It's not some ivory tower thing. It's not an armchair theologian kind of only for the university or something. This is something that just permeates all the way down in terms of. I mean, do, uh, uh, the baptism of children. That is a application of covenant theology. Mm -hmm. Um, what we do in worship and our liturgy as a covenant act you know, every Sunday morning, covenant theology impacts um, so many things from re redemption in Christ to who we are as covenant, either covenant breakers in Adam or covenant keepers in Christ. Uh, it, it just impacts so many things. Is, is there any more thing you can think of it? Kind who of we are. Impacted? I mean, who we are. We are covenant servants. Yeah. But even though we, but we say covenant servants... Yeah, we also have that incredible confidence because Christ is the capital S covenant servant who has kept the law's demands for us. And so we, we undergo service toward God, but we do so without fear of condemnation because we know that all things are, are, are fulfilled in Christ. And so our identity, um, not just the baptism of infants, but the baptism of adults too. Yes, yeah, all but baptism. The, yeah, yeah the, our prayers are made in the name of Christ. Our prayers that rise up before him as a, a pleasing um, a fragrance, a pleasing sacrifice to him. That's covenantal. The but Bible's you know, covenantal. In Bible's terms of, covenantal. It's a covenant word of God given mm -hmm. in covenant. It's his covenantal um, uh, dealings, yeah. The Lord's Supper is covenantal. We think about gathering around the table and eating and drinking together. That's a, a covenant meal just like a wedding reception it is a covenant meal that seals and confirms to us a gift from God to his people that we are indeed in covenant with him and mm -hmm. welcome to commune with him. Yeah. I mean, is there any part of Christian life you can think of that's not covenantal, Brandon? I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I can't think I of anything. I don't think so. I don't think so. 
Uh, well, you have some books that you yeah. wanted to, uh, to demo. You already showed us the Bible, but what else do you have for Absolutely. us? Absolutely. Uh, uh, a great introduction. If you're like, hey, I, 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 I want to kind of dabble in covenant theology. I, I want to know more about it. This is a very short book, as you can see. It's called A Sacred Bond, Covenant Theology Explored by Michael Brown and Zach Keel. Um, and this is the second edition of it. But uh, I would recommend this mm -hmm. book as a good starter, just to try to kind of get your feet wet in covenant theology. Uh, another great book, it's a little bit bigger as you can tell, it's called Covenant Theology, Biblical, Historical, and Theological Perspectives, edited by God, or God, by God edited by <laughs> Guy Waters. The source of it's God, but... <laughs> and, uh, John um, Meether, uh, Nicholas Reed. And this is a series of essays, so you don't need to read the book cover to cover. You can actually pick and choose which essays in, in this book you want to read, but just a, a very helpful collection of uh, different um, essays in covenant theology that you might like. Um, with that, uh, we thank you. And again, this is a podcast of Cincy Reformed, and we are uh, sponsored by Westside Reformed Church. You can visit us at cincyreformed.org or westsidereformed.org. Have a good day. Thank you.